Our speaker tonight is our uh, longtime member, Jan Delantonio. He is a uh, physics uh, professor at Brown University, uh, where he's been there since 1999. And he's been a member of Skyscraper since 2003. We've had a lot of great talks from Jan, and he's been very instrumental in a lot of uh, help and guidance and advice for the group for uh, many years. Uh, he's going to be speaking tonight about observing at Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile before and during the pandemic. I do remember a great talk he gave about going down there uh, before the pandemic and doing some work. And I'm sure that uh, like many of us, he wishes he could go back down to places like that and hopefully we will again. But uh, I don't want to go into this anymore without any further ado. If Jan, if you're ready, it'd be great to hear from you and uh, looking yeah. forward to your talk tonight. Yeah, let me share my screen. Steve, uh, uh, obviously people can Which ask Steve? questions. Oh, Steve H, you. Yes. Sorry. Um, obviously people can ask questions later, but if there are burning questions, because I won't be able to see you after I uh, share my screen, um, if you can put them in the chat. Steve, can you basically interrupt me whenever there's a question? Uh, you can be sure. as interrupty as you want. Uh, okay. I think that's that's a, a a way to address the questions right away. So this is a picture actually of of what's colloquially called the mushroom farm. It's uh, the set of telescopes that have grown up uh, below the summit, most of which do not belong to the National Observatories. They're tenant uh, telescopes, and it's all grown up in the last few decades. I'll show you pictures that I took uh, 20 years ago, where essentially none of these telescopes were there. Um, so what I want to do today is, is tell you a little bit about observing, a little bit about Cerro Tololo, a little bit about my history with Cerro Tololo, and, um, and how observing has changed in the last two years uh, with the pandemic, uh, both for the positive and maybe more for the negative. Um, and then I'll, since I can't resist telling you a little bit about what I'm doing currently at Tololo, I'll let you know a little bit about the current research project there. Um, before I begin, though, I did want to dedicate this talk um, to Arlo Landolt. I don't know how many of you actually knew Arlo. Arlo spent essentially his entire career visiting the observatories, the National Observatories, and anyone who does photometry uh, owes a debt of gratitude because Arlo spent 60 years calibrating all of the standard stars that are used for measuring and, and uh, determining the brightness of distant stars and galaxies. And Arlo did this by spending weeks and weeks and weeks at the observatories each night that was clear, painfully measuring one star at a time or only a few stars at a time. And basically every year I went down to Chile at least once I overlapped with Arlo and he was a fantastic and gracious host. He also was one of the most formal dressers being of a generation quite a bit earlier than mine. In fact, I was very surprised to find in the archives a picture of him in a t-shirt because I always remember him in a dinner jacket. Um, but he passed away two weeks ago. And so I wanted to, to dedicate this to Arlo. Um, so Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory or CTIO as I'll always refer to it is the Southern station for the US National Observatories. And uh, it was, started in 1962, only five years after the formal establishment of the National Observatories and four years after the decision to build on uh, telescopes on Kitt Peak. In the early days, of course, the transportation to the mountain looked more like the picture on the right. I'm lucky never to have had to take a mule up to the top. Uh, but already by the 1960s, late 60s, the uh, roads, dirt roads existed to the top. And you'll notice that what they did was they basically leveled the top of the mountaintop and built a platform that was flat on which they built a bunch of telescopes. Cerro Tololo was chosen because it was a very good site, but also because it really matched the observations at Kitt Peak. So Kitt Peak's at a latitude of plus 30, Cerro Tololo's at minus 30. Between the two of them, you can cover the whole sky. At the moment, the National Observatories, which have been renamed, it's now called NOIR Lab or National Optical and Infrared Laboratory, uh, runs two Southern Hemisphere stations. One is Cerro Tololo and the other is Cerro Pachon, which is 20 kilometers away. And I'll show you some pictures because the two mountains can be seen from each other. 
Tololo, as I said, is, is now home for to tens of telescopes. But in fact, only a handful of them are run by the national observatories. Most of the rest are tenant telescopes. The telescopes that I mostly use at Tololo, in fact, all, except for a couple of runs, the telescope I've always used is the Victor Blanco four meter telescope, which was begun in 1974, again, about eight years after the Kitt Peak telescope was built um, and finished in 1976. It's intended to be the twin. And as all twins are, it's not exactly the same. It's just a tiny bit bigger than the Kitt Peak four meter. Um, but for a long time, until 1998, it was the largest Southern Hemisphere telescope. Um, it's not that anymore, but it still has the widest field of view of any Southern Hemisphere telescope, at least for another year-ish, uh, until the Vera Rubin Observatory starts observing. Um, in 2024 is when the survey starts. Hopefully, fingers crossed, the camera will be down there sometime around the end of this year. Um, the building itself is gigantic. Uh, the picture on at the, the top of construction actually gives you a better sense of how big the building is because you can see there's a tiny person there for scale. Um, this was an era when the thought was if you build a telescope on a tall pier, you'll get better image quality. Uh, but of course, the telescope itself generates its own seeing, and so it actually doesn't do quite as well as the as the site itself. The the dome um, and the telescope occupy that upper region of the of of the of the building and in a giant open space with a catwalk that always terrifies me when I look at it. I obviously you don't have to go up the catwalk, but I cannot imagine climbing those stairs. The telescope itself is also huge. It's rests on a uh, it, you know it's got a it's an equatorial mount so it has a giant yoke and the telescope itself rests uh, and moves on a thin pad of oil, which makes it uh, very low friction and so allows a relatively small motor to drive the telescope around. The instruments on the telescope are, are divided into two categories. There are the Cassegrain focus instruments, but most of the time I've been using the prime focus instruments where the cameras are to provide a larger field and a, and a better image quality. You can see in the bottom the, the the opening of the, the four meter, there are, there are these pedals which protect it during the day and pedals also protect the prime focus uh, cage. But the, but the prime focus is accessible at a platform. And one of my favorite activities going to a, a telescope is to ask somebody to take a picture of myself through the mirror of the four meter. So this is me standing at the liquid nitrogen filling tank where you can fill the, the coolant for the prime focus detector uh, looking at the, the, the mirror. So my history with Tololo, I did not use any Southern Hemisphere telescope for my PhD, but in 1995, I was hired by what was then AT&T Bell Labs and very soon to stop being AT&T Bell Labs, it became Lucent and then spun off various ways. Um, this was a time when Bell Labs was still in, in the, the, the sort of twilight of its glory days. And it had people doing research on everything under the sun or beyond the sun in this case. And Tony Tyson, who was my boss there, uh, was interested in astrophysics and, and in particular in the problem of uh, detecting distant galaxies. And he had just finished building a camera, um, the big throughput camera. You'll notice that astronomers are really bad at naming things. This will come back and back and forth in the, in the in, in the talk. Um, but it, it was also a clever way of introducing the names of the two builders of the camera, Bernstein and Tyson. So big throughput, but also BT. Um, this camera was one of the first big mosaic cameras. It was four 2K by 2K CCD and a single focal plane. Each CCD had its own lens to refocus light onto it. It, it was, a uh, at the time, you know, getting 16 megapixels in 1995 was, was considered really good. Um, and we loaned this camera to Cerro Tololo for to use as the main prime focus camera for the Blanco telescope in exchange for 15 nights of telescope time a year. And as part of the exchange, my job was to help astronomers use the camera 
Uh, and that involved me being at Tololo for two to three week stretches, two to three times a year, in addition to our own observing. And so this is how I actually got to, to meet many of the people involved in this research, because this is the camera that was responsible for half of the observations that Alex Zilopetko and others would talk about uh, that led to the Nobel Prize for Dark Energy. The other half was, of course, the, the mosaic camera on the Canada France Hawaii telescope. This was the main prime focus camera for the telescope in, at, for the Blanco until 1998, and then was retired. And a couple of years ago, it actually resurfaced. It's now on display at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in DC. So in 1998, coincidental with the retiring of, of the BTC, um, the National Observatories debuted a new camera and I moved to the National Observatories. I actually moved to Tucson, but two new cameras were, were commissioned, one for, for the Kitt Peak 4 meter, one for the Sarasololo 4 meter. And again, being astronomers, we called them mosaic because they were mosaic cameras. In fact, they were mosaic one and two, mosaic two being the Sarasololo camera. Uh, they were a step up from BTC. There were eight two by four KCCDs. So again, 64 megapixels, also in a tighter configuration. One of the big problems with the BTC is that there was a huge gap in the middle. So you had to take huge dithers to make, to make a filled frame. But once again, since I had been hired to do this to, to the observatory, my job was actually to help people learn how to use the cameras. And so I would go up to Kid Peak a few times a month uh, since I was in Tucson, of course, I could drive up, which was nice. Um, my job was not to go down to Tololo for that, but in 1999, while I was a postdoc there, I managed to get uh, a very, very large proposal uh, accepted by the observatory. And again, I was not particularly good with naming since I was interested in deep imaging of gravitational lenses. The survey was called the Deep Lens Survey. And eventually it ended up being a 120 night survey where I spent 50 nights at Kitt Peak and 70 at Cerro Tololo. And this occupied the better part of a decade. But of course, in 2000, I moved to Providence. And so from here, I actually ended up going down to use Mosaic. Um, the idea behind the Deep Lens Survey was just to look at random regions of the sky. The picture you have on the right is one ninth of one of the random regions of the sky and just to measure whatever was there. And we detected a whole bunch of galaxy clusters. We detected the lensing signal from the large scale structure of the universe a bunch of things came out of that survey. But it also kept me going down to Tololo every year, which was perhaps not the least of the side benefits of that survey. Technology marches on. The mosaic uh, by 2010 was getting kind of old and slow. One of the things about mosaic, even though it had the filled field of view, uh, in order to keep the readout noise low, the readout time for mosaic north was three minutes. Like every time you close the shutter, you had to wait three minutes. That meant really long exposures were very, pref very, very much better than the short exposures because you wouldn't waste quite as much time. Uh, for Mosaic 2, they had actually built two amplifiers for each per CCD. And so that cut the, the time to one and a half minutes. But even so, 90 seconds at each shutter closing meant that you really were taking long exposures in order to be efficient. In 2012, a new camera was built. It was actually built by Fermilab, um, and Fermilab is no better at naming things than I am. And so they decided to run the dark energy survey, and therefore they built the dark energy camera. And this is the camera that is currently on the Blanco telescope. So it's, it's reaching its 10-year time now. DCAM is 62 2x4 two KCCDs, so now you, it's a 576 megapixel camera. But actually, it's more than that because it also has four 2K by 2K chips that are purely dedicated to guiding. And as a great bonus, it has two 2, two by 2 uh, chips that have a different pedestal level, an adjustable pedestal level um, that allows them to be held at opposite sides of the optimal focus. And that means that by constantly reading out those chips and figuring out the focus, you can actually follow the focus of the telescope and that means no more stopping to refocus because the telescope maintains focus throughout the entire night. It is one of the great advances. I, I can't tell you how many hours I spent trying to get the four meter back to reasonable focus after the temperature dropped three degrees or four degrees. Um, so I was lucky enough to be invited to participate in the science validation program. 
And over the next few years, I kept using the camera one to two times per year for a couple of nights. But in 2019, I got lucky again. And I, I actually got another of these large programs approved, a 40 night program to run uh, 2020 to 2023. Um, and in fact, we managed to get our first night uh, and our first run at Tololo at the end of 2019. Uh, and then something happened, something you all know happened, and observing at Tololo stopped. So before I go on, I, I should tell you a little bit about how you get to Tololo and, and what you do to get uh, time. So the first thing you have to do to be able to use the, the CTIO four meters, you have to get telescope time. Every six months, March, end of March, end of September, uh, you submit proposals to the national observatories, Proposals get submitted for all the telescopes. Telescopes at Kid Peak, actually, there are not that many left that we could propose for. At CTIO, the, since then, technology has raised uh, significantly. The National Observatories and Honoria Lab runs two 8.2 meters, one in Hawaii, one on Cerro Pachon. And then there's a smattering of other telescopes that make time available. So Las Cumbres makes some time available. The Anglo-Australian Telescope, Keck, Subaru, each makes a small handful of nights. When you write your proposal, proposals are not very long. They're five or six pages long. Uh, and then a panel of eight astronomers reads 40 or 50 of those. Typically about 600 proposals are now submitted per semester. So there are lots of panels. And then the highly ranked proposals from each of the panels are compared to each other and you get a ranking per telescope. Basically for the bigger telescopes, about one in three proposals right now get some time. That fluctuates a bit with the years. And if you're successful and you get, get some time, you do a little dance and then you start planning. Once you have time before the pandemic, you had to get to Chile. Keep in mind, it's a 10 to 11 hour flight from the south southern part of the US. There was a there used to be a very nice flight from JFK, um, but it was run by the Chilean airline Lan Chile. And, uh, for a while, it was cross-listed, so you could use uh, U.S. government funds to, to pay your way, but then they stopped cross-listing it, so uh, most of my flying went through Dallas or Miami to get down. Um, it's a 10-hour flight because, of course, you're going one-sixth of the way around the Earth to get to Santiago. You Typically, it's an overnight flight. You arrive bleary-eyed in Santiago, and then you have to get from Santiago to La Serena. La Serena is the headquarters of the of Noir Lab South or of Cerro Tololo, of uh, CTIO. And the two choices when I started were to take a one hour flight or a 12 hour bus ride. That's a no brainer, right? You've, you've flown for 12 hours, you're not gonna sit in a bus for 12 hours. It is cheaper, but it is not convenient. So typically you fly and, and because Chile is very long, the flight, the air infrastructure to fly up and down the coast is actually quite well developed. There's a, a flight every hour that basically hops its way up the coast. But by the time you get to La Serena, it's middle of the afternoon and you can try to get up the mountain, but almost always I decide to spend the night in La Serena. The compound which serves as the headquarters for the observatory also has houses for, for the researchers that are on the staff, but they've reserved one of the houses as a motel, uh, which is really just a four room house. And so you get a room in that house and you hang out. Uh, it's a very nice, peaceful area just above the city. And you can notice in the picture on the right, in the, uh, in the afternoons, the rabbits come out and, and graze on the grass. So it's a, it's a very peaceful place to go. And then you can stroll down into the city to have dinner. And uh, dinner does not start in Chile or in La Serena before 8.30. If you show up at a restaurant before then, they'll look at you as if you're very strange. Um, but this is also a place where you used to meet visiting astronomers coming down from the mountain. So you get some uh, news about the observatory directly uh, at that point. And that's something that's gone now that uh, that observing is remote. How are we doing? All right, hopefully at this point you've had a night's of rest. The next morning it's time to go up to the mountain. In general, you're not allowed to drive your car up to Tololo. Uh, I've heard of some exceptions being given, but I've never tried to get one. Uh, so typically you would sign up for a van service that drives up a couple times a day 
from the headquarters up to the mountain. The first hour is paved road. You drive along the grapevines of the Elkie Valley. The Elkie Valley is um, is very picturesque. It's where they grow the grapes to make Pisco, which is a fairly powerful liqueur that I cannot uh, particularly stomach, but, uh, but a lot of people love it. Um, and then you turn off and the next couple hours are on a very desolate road. Um, over the time I've been going there, they've actually dammed the Elkie River and they've created this beautiful artificial lake in the bottom that you can see from Tololo. But the picture in the middle gives you a sense of, of what the, the scene looks like from there. The road gets ever more desolate until finally you can see in the distance in the picture on the right, a little dome appearing. That's the four meter as seen from the road. Once you get to the top, you get a sense of just how empty the road down is. Uh, in particular, the road turns so you can't actually get, you know, you go around that mountain in the distance. Um, and you also get a sense of, of how dry the area is. The analogy I usually give is if you've ever been to the deserts around Tucson, if you take all the little shrubs and stretch them out a factor of two further apart from each other, that gives you some sense of what the, the land around Tololo looks like. That most of the green things are near the buildings where there's some water. But apart from that, there's very little along the road. OK, so you made it to Tololo. Congratulations. What next? Well, when you arrive, um, and you don't arrive very high, uh, Tololo is actually only at about 2,200 meters. Uh, it's not the high Andes. You see the high Andes from there, but it's not very, very high up. Um, you arrive in, and I remind you that astronomers aren't good at naming things, at the round office building. One guess at which one the round office building is. And they give you a key to the dorm, a key to the telescopes, and a car, and a key to the car. And that used to be a big adventure because in the early 70s, the director of CTIO found in a used car auction a really good deal on old VW Beetles. And so there used to be a dozen old stick shift Beetles, which, you know, you're driving up the mountain, which is a harrowing experience. Now the experience is much, much, much safer, but also much more boring because they have little Toyotas. From the round office building, it's just a quick walk down to the dormitory, which you see on the left in that picture. The dormitory has two wings. Each, each wing has I forgot, it's something like 12 rooms. And then there's a central hall, which is the dining hall. The rooms are, I would say, Spartan. They're basically a bed, a bathroom, and uh, a little desk. Um, the kitchen does serve four meals a day, and you get to choose three of them. I have never made it to breakfast but I sometimes make it to lunch and dinner. And then they provide what's known as a night lunch where you carry up to the telescope, sandwiches, soup, coffee, and often cookies. And of course there are also unexpected guests in the rooms. Uh, last time I was there, you see there's a little gecko that occupied my bathroom. And then in 2002, I happened to have another visitor uh, outside my door. And in fact, there are lots of animals that live along alongside the observatory. In addition to the lizards and the tarantulas and the geckos, I found scorpions in my suitcase. And uh, particularly a few years ago, you used to uh, to be hounded by foxes uh, every time you walked up with your night lunch because they had learned that astronomers were always carrying food when they came up at night. And so they would sit there and look cute and try to beg food from you. In addition to that, in the evenings uh, on the rock piles, there are viscachas, which are whose function is much more like marmots, but look like rabbits with long tails, which are amazingly pretty uh, beasts. And then, of course, there are always condors and vultures flying around the mountain. Jan, uh, there's a question about how big the spider is. Um, that's a normal room. Right, so the spider is roughly, you know, a little bit larger than ham sized. Um, I ran into this fellow. This the picture was taken at 4 a.m. or 4:55 a.m. on a summer night at the end of an observing run, and so I stumbled down bleary eyed, and it was there, and I had to decide what to do. And I took this picture, and then I went through that door, and went to sleep. And then at 10 o'clock, I heard people 
shouting outside and apparently a cook was summoned with a broom to to shoo off the the offender um these tarantulas are, are not deadly their their poison is actually not particularly strong uh and they're they're slow moving and not particularly dangerous but it, it is a somewhat daunting task to have to walk under one when you're coming off an observing uh, night i i have a comment i have a yeah. ah! <laughs> I, I heard stories, again, I, I don't know if they're true, uh, from the old timers who would develop at the end of the night of finding them in the developing rooms. Uh, I have no experience of that. So I'd much rather see them outside the dorm room than in the developing room. The dining hall is, in some ways, or was the heart of the mountain. In the evenings, this is where the observers would all meet every telescope used to have an observer and you would go and talk and swap research stories. So, so this is where I would meet Arlo. The, the dining hall uh, chefs, uh, as with all government employees, have, uh, have to do some professional development. And so every year they got sent to do pastry school or something else, and they would provide very, very good meals. Although I will say that, that uh, Monday is when the provisions come in. So by Sunday, you know, the empanada contains whatever was in the meal on Wednesday and, and so on. They were very well packaged, but you could tell that, that, that they got very good at stretching leftovers. The view from this room, this room faces east and faces the Andes, is the best view that from any cafeteria I can imagine. It is really uh, astounding. At lunchtime, interestingly enough, there's a completely different character because this is when the workers uh, you know the the engineers and the the opticians and the and the electrical engineers meet, and so it's much more loud, much more uh, uh, vibrant, uh, and it's also a great way if you speak a little bit of Spanish to figure out what's actually happening. You know what instruments are are near to breaking or what else is happening because you you get to overhear lots of details about uh, about the telescopes. In the afternoon, you, if you've got the energy, you can walk around. Um, the path from the dorm to the telescopes takes about 20 minutes. I'm not in fantastic shape, so 20 minutes is reasonable. You can see the beginning of the path there. In fact, this is an old photo. If you look carefully, you can actually see the VW Beetles all back there. The, uh, the staff got pickup trucks, but the astronomers got the Beetles. Um, and the path would lead you up to the telescope. And typically, uh, before... Uh, before DCAM, um, you would take control of the telescope at 4 p.m. to take your flat fields and your biases and your calibration images. Um, now, uh, with DCAM, the staff does this because they don't trust us poor astronomers to not break the telescope. And so you don't get to control the calibration images anymore, which is, I think, a bit of a shame, but is actually convenient because it gives you time to wander around and to give it a sense of the mountain. So this is from the dormitory looking up actually in two different seasons. These are two visits three months apart. It gives you a sense of just how little things grow on the mountain because the vegetation is basically the same. And the only difference is one of them is in winter and you can see the snow. I mentioned that, that there's another telescope that's visible. Um, Cerro Pachon is uh, 20 kilometers away. It's a little bit higher up. In 2001, they were just building the Gemini South 8-meter telescope, and there were no other telescopes on the mountain. This was the last time I was there in 2019, and you can see Gemini is now fully operational. They finished building the SOAR 4.1-meter, of which the National Observatory owns 30%. And here's the Rubin Observatory, not quite completed. It's now been completed. And I showed you the picture of the mushroom farm at the beginning. This is now looking down at the mushroom farm in 2002. And you can see that the only telescope there is the, the near-infrared telescope for the two-mass survey. Everything else, so the, two, the telescope is, is in this enclosure. I don't know if you can see my mouse. It's in the middle of the, the drawing. Everything else has grown up since then. And it's sobering to think that some of these telescopes are quite a bit bigger than the telescopes apart from the four meter at the at the top of the mountain there there's at least one two meter in this set uh, but these are all tenant observatories 
um, from different universities and different research projects in different countries. Uh, yeah, and a couple of other questions. Sure. Uh, somebody asked about, are there many cloudy nights? And uh, what time of year was this picture taken? Do you remember? This picture was not taken by me, so I don't know. Um, uh, the cloudy nights, is, so a lot depends on whether it's an El Nino year or a La Nina year. Uh, on El Nino years, uh, roughly two thirds of the nights are usable, where usable includes nights with Cirrus. And in La Nina years, it's close to 90%. You get lots and lots of clear nights. Uh, so again, part of the reason this area was chosen is that it provides lots of nights that are, are clear. This is not a clear night. You can see lots and lots of cirrus. A better indication might have been this one, or even this one. Again, two successive nights, pretty good weather. Was there another question? Sorry, no, there wasn't. No. Okay. Um, you also get a couple of, of interesting features. So you get interesting sun dogs and reflections. If you're up in the afternoon, you can see things uh, that normally you wouldn't see in the evenings. But the real show happens at sunset because at sunset, everybody gathers uh, to look at the sunset. And because Tololo is the first relatively high mountain uh, coming off the ocean, as you look west, you're basically looking over miles and miles of ocean. And so everyone looks out, gathers outside to see if they can see the green flash. And I have never reliably seen it because I always look too soon and then I see green flashes everywhere. Um, but people next to me keep saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I saw it. Um, yeah. But it is, it is one of those places where, where your sunset, your horizon is actually the horizon, right? You, you get to see the, the ground, especially at sunset. At night, one of the nice things is that the water currents uh, off the shore are actually quite cool. And so you often develop ground fog. That ground fog doesn't reach up to Tololo, of course, but it hides the light of La Serena some, was it 50, 60 kilometers away? and makes the skies even darker than they would otherwise be. OK, so once you're done what, looking at the sunset, you go into the control room. The control room is on the ground floor at, at the CTO 4 meter. That keeps you as far away from your body heat producing uh, interference with the telescope as possible. But also, it makes it easy for you to go outside and check the weather and look outside. This is what the work area looked like in 20, 20 years ago. There was a telescope operator associated with the telescope. In 2002, they were responsible for guiding and slewing the telescope. So you were allowed by the computer to move the telescope less than one degree. Any move more than one degree had to be done by the telescope operator. And then there were observer stations. And some of you who are older will recognize what types of computers they were. They were very old sun workstations. Um, even then, they were fairly old sun workstations. And so this is what, what observing looked like in 2002. These are some of my colleagues, many of whom are now senior astronomers at other institutions, uh, trying to take data 20 years ago. This is what the control room looks now, like, well, what it looked like in 2019. It's much slicker. There are many, many more monitors per station. And the d one thing about the dark energy camera is that, that uh, you now get to control both the, gu the guiding and the telescope directly from the computer. So the operator is basically there mostly for safety and to do the checkout at the beginning and end of the night. And then you come back with the data. And I still have you know, cabinets filled with DLT tapes that we would carry through. This was by far the fastest way to bring 80 gigabytes of data back uh, in 2002. And now, of course, it all gets transferred to an archive in Tucson. And we actually don't ever bring data back now, it, we get it by FTP from Tucson the day after we take the data. OK. The world changed, of course, uh, and observing changed drastically in March 2020. We had just had a first night of observing in February. And then uh, the observatory shut down for four months through the pandemic. 
all the nights that we had were canceled. They have since been rescheduled. But when it came back in September 2020, Saratololo is now a completely remote operation. There is still support staff and telescope operators on the mountain, but all the observing is remote. And even the telescope operators and support staff are in separate rooms on the mountaintop. What I've tried to do is create a mock-up in Barrison Holly. So I have, well, I don't have 20 monitors, but I have four that serve as the, as the operational heart whenever I have to observe. The telescope is all now controlled by, tele, by uploaded scripts, which program uh, where the telescope should be going, what filter to use, what the exposure time is. And you basically spend the night staring at this running scroll, or at least one of the people observing stares at this running scroll to make sure that the exposure time is dipping down, that all those little blocks are green because the exposures have correctly compiled and that there are no weird alarms. Um, oddly enough, green alarms are good that means things are working red alarms are the ones you want to be aware of in addition to the telescope control screen of course you do have also monitoring screens that tells you where the telescope is pointed what the instrument status is there's actually some 20 or so of these status windows that you periodically look at but of course the data itself is too big for you to transfer across every time dcam closes each raw image is more than two gigabytes, and there's not enough bandwidth to actually look at that image. And that means that a lot of the preliminary analysis for data quality actually gets done on the mountain now. And what you get is a running tally of what the PSF size, what the seeing is. This is January 31st, so this was actually a week ago. Um, and you can see the PSF, the sky brightness, clouds, and, and what targets I was looking at. Um, and so, you know, you can display the images locally. There, there's a 10 micron all sky camera that allows you to see if there's a big bank of clouds coming in. And you, typically we have two observers, one who's paying attention to the, uh, to the data stream and one who's doing data quality checks. All through this Zoom, just like this, is used to, to pay attention to the, the night operator. And so we talk to the night operator periodically just to make sure things are okay. But the operator mostly is there now for safety. Another question. And also to authorize people to use the the the, the data. Another yeah. question. Uh, somebody asked about moonlight moonless nights. Do you need those to do your observing? I do. And actually, this will come back in the pluses and minuses because one of the things that has happened with remote observing is now I get a lot more moonless nights or moonless periods. Actually, that's the next slide. So the pluses and minuses, what's changed for the better? Well, it's way cheaper. To, to log in and log into Zoom, right? That's free. Whereas trip to Chile are usually $2,000 per round trip and you get charged to stay at the dormitories. So it's roughly $150 a night for lodging and meals. It also takes you a day to get there and a day to get back. That doesn't have to happen. And this thing about moonless night is that time is now scheduled way more efficiently. I have many fewer moonlight time periods because now they can schedule half or even quarter nights where you log in just during the dark period of the night. And so that allows me to, to be more efficient in terms of observing when, when the conditions are good for me. And the other thing that's non-trivial is that the connection to Zoom and the connection to the control, the observers don't have to be in the same location. So collaborators that are at multiple different institutions can log in at the same time and, and observe together. And that means that many more students can participate in the research. With the pluses come minuses. Going to Chile is fun, right? It's time consuming, but it's really nice to be on Tololo. And it's one of the more beautiful spots on earth. And the other thing is that things like the 10 micron cameras don't really make up for the sense you get when you step outside and you feel the humidity in the air, or you look at the twinkling on the horizon and you say, oh, look, and you can actually see the speed at which a bank of clouds is approaching. The other thing that you lose over Zoom is the interactions with the staff. You find out, of course, when things break, but you don't find out when things are close to breaking in the way that you could before, because you don't have the afternoons to shoot the breeze with the staff to figure out, well, what's going on? You log in just for your own observing. And the other thing is you don't interact with anybody else on the mount. So there are no interactions with other astronomers, and that means no new collaborations get born this way. I think overall, you know, I live with the with the pluses and 
I but uh, and survive the minuses. But if we could go back to Chile, I definitely would, at least some of the time. It's true, half nights are useful. Uh, you know, there, there are advantages to, to not having to be up all night. Is there another question on the chat? I had a question. Uh, Zoom, yeah. you, go ahead. Do you have it, Steve? Zoom Zoom isn't always a reliable thing. I mean, if your signal strength dies a little bit and so forth, how does that affect your experience? Yeah, so another reason we have multiple people at each run is precisely that. So that if one person's connection dies. So we famously uh, on about a year ago, we set up to run on, uh, on in Barris and Holly and someone decided to cut the power to the building a half hour before the observing started. Um, that caused a mad dash for me to drive home, log onto my laptop, and actually start running over the laptop. You can run the telescope over the laptop. I have. It's not terribly fun because all the screens piled up on each other and you end up cycling from one screen to the other the entire night. But you can do it. Um, we now have multiple observers and we tend to have people at different sites. So. One of my ex postdoc our grad students is now a postdoc in Tucson. If the power's out here, if there's a storm here, there likely isn't a storm in Tucson. So during the the uh, blizzard uh, last week, I was actually observing, and my backups were in Tucson and Houston, figuring that if one of if my power died, somebody else would be able to observe. Question. Yeah, another question. Uh, will remote viewing be a permanent policy after the pandemic? I hope not, but I've not actually heard an official news. I, I suspect that they will let people come for multi, multiple night runs, but that there will be people who choose to, to do remote observing. Um, one of the things that, that they've done now is given us lots of half nights. And so if you have lots of half nights or if you have gaps between the nights, it can be quite expensive to go down there. Um, and so that I think will will change. Hey, I'd still I still want to go. That's basically it. Okay, I want to close with just a couple minutes on what I'm doing, and then I'll let let you all go. Um, so what am I doing with the telescope? Well, my area of research is gravitational lensing. I care about the bending of light to the gravity because this is my way of weighing distant objects. And the nice thing about gravitational lensing is lensing doesn't care what you're weighing. You can weigh gas, you can weigh stars, you can galaxies, dark matter, photons, you can weigh light. As long as it has energy, it bends light. And that means that you can get a sense of re what's really there. And in particular, I'm interested in galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are misnomers because there's a lot more gas in galaxy clusters than there are galaxies in terms of mass. And there's even more dark matter. It turns out they're all swirling around in their own, you know, in the mutual gravity. If the cluster is in complete equilibrium, then all of the, the, the components are going to be in the same place. But if there are clusters that collide, the gas collides and the galaxies, which are mostly empty space, pass through each other, which means the gas will be in a different place than the, than the galaxies. If the dark matter has some self-interaction, like a pressure, like a gas, then it will also separate from the galaxies. And I'm studying a whole bunch of clusters to figure out is the dark matter separated? We know already that it doesn't have the same level of interactions as the gas because it's nowhere near where the gas is. What I'm trying to figure out is, is there a little bit of interaction? Because we know so little about this stuff that it, it would help narrow down the models drastically. This is actually an example of one of the images. This is part of ABEL 3667. It gives you some sense of what the images I'm taking are. Each of the data sets I take are about five and a half hours of exposure per cluster divided among five filters from the ultraviolet to Z, which goes to the silicon edge at one micron. We take the images in batches because if you take one single long exposures, it turns out these detectors are amazingly good cosmic ray detectors. And so a long exposure would not only saturate the sky, but you'd fill the detector full of cosmic rays. So typically in each filter, we take 20 or more exposures and then we, we process them, register, stack, scale them, stack them, mask out the cosmic rays. And the final images go to about 26 magnitude, depending on, on each filter. 
Uh, we use the R-band images to measure the shapes. It's about a million shapes for galaxies per image. And the other bands give the colors. Images, the image analysis isn't perfect. You'll notice there's a little bit of a bowl. Our local sky measurement algorithm over subtracts the light around giant ellipticals a little bit. Uh, that's not terrible from a gravitational lensing point of view, but uh, the people in my group that are interested in intracluster light tear their hair out whenever they see an image like this. I use this then the shapes of the background galaxies to figure out where the dark matter is. And in color here, I have two different maps of where the dark matter is. Um, on the image on the left, I've also shown in pink what, where the x-rays are. So this is a cluster where there seems to be another lump of dark matter, but most of the dark matter and most of the galaxies and most of the uh, lensing are co-located. I showed you the image on the right because it's got an interesting feature on it. There's a seventh magnitude M dwarf star just off the field of view which in the infrared filters causes great scattered light features. So you get you know, rings, you've got this big scattered light spray. That shows up only in the Z-band image. It turns out not to affect our shapes particularly much. But this is a case where, if you notice, the, the brightest galaxy is oriented at sort of minus 45 degrees, or sorry, 135 degrees orientation, minus 45. Um, but the dark matter actually has a completely different orientation than the galaxy. And that's something we found in a few cases. So when I'm observing next, tomorrow, tomorrow is one of my, my observing nights. Here's the telescope schedule for February. And you can see my name is on there for February 6th. It's a first half night, which means that I'll log in to Zoom at 7.30, take control of the telescope. So the operator gives you control of the, and also he's responsible for telling you the passwords for that night so you can actually access the telescope. And, um, and then I log in at 7.30 and I run till 11.55 when I have to give up to Alexi Litton from Santa Cruz, who's doing her own project. Um, I have another 12 nights this spring, all spread out this way. And I'm pretty sure that through the end of this spring, it'll be remote observing. I've asked for 10, my project has 10 more nights in the fall. I'm somewhat hopeful, but not immensely optimistic that those will be in person. We'll see how that goes. That's it. Questions? That was great. Um, are you seeing any interference from Starlink satellites? I know you said mentioned cosmic rays, but. Yeah, so so I have seen some. Uh, you get it in the evenings. Uh, I've not been unlucky enough to have an actual launch during one of my nights. So I don't get the stream of, of satellites. Uh, but there are, the, the expectation is that every DCAM field or every other DCAM field probably has a Starlink in it. Um, and part of what we do is, uh, or will have a Starlink in it. Uh, part of what we do is, is we use those 20 exposures to, to, to basically mask out the regions. So it costs us exposure time, but it does not kill us at this stage. John, can you tell the story about the It's gonna be more of an you... issue for the Rubin Observatory. Oh yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, could you tell the story about the image that you took that led to a discovery by another astronomer not too long ago? Sorry, Steve, I, I missed this. Can you repeat it? Apologies. Yeah, you. one of your images was instrumental in another astronomer discovering some object or some... Uh, oh, yeah. So, so... So again, I'm interested in galaxies and galaxies are faint and low surface brightness things. And so the first 20 minutes of each night when you're going from, so you don't get a control of the telescope now until the sun's at minus 10. From minus 10 to minus 16, the sky's way too bright for me. So one of my, uh, one of my colleagues, one of the astronomers at the Southwest Research Institute called me up uh, about six months ago and said, well, if you're not doing anything for the last 10 minutes, for the first 10 minutes of the night, can I look uh, in the direction close to the sun for that period? And so I said, sure. And uh, we ended up discovering the closest orbiting asteroid to the sun uh, in those images. Not, not at all my science, but it's a nice byproduct of, of the observing. It turns out it's really hard to get a time allocation committee to give you time for just the first 10 minutes of every night. 
So this these observations are only possible through this informal way of people calling each other up and saying, well, if you can't use the time, can you give me those minutes? Um, all right, let me stop sharing because that way I can see you all. Ah, nice to see you all. Uh, other questions? I know I'm a bit long. Is it better to look in the southern hemisphere for your research than it is in the northern hemisphere at Kitt Peak, for example? It's slightly better in the sense there are a few more galaxy clusters in the southern hemisphere. But frankly, the big issue is that as a professional astronomer, I don't have access to a large camera in the north. The Kitt Peak 4 meter has now been loaned off for a spectroscopic survey. The wind telescope is now being used for. Uh, radial velocity measurements of exoplanets. Those are both great projects, but it means that I have no access to a camera. If I were Canadian, I could use the Canadian France Hawaii telescope, at least for a few more years. Or if I was Japanese, I could use the Subaru telescope. Um, but as an American astronomer, I have to go south if I want to make wide field images. Sure. Um, doing all this wonderful science on the top of the mountain requires a lot of electricity. How is that provided to these facilities? So there are actual power lines that run up, up the desert mountain to Tololo. Tololo does also have a backup generator, but, uh, but power actually comes from the dam that was built in the Elki Valley, which is a hydroelectric power uh, plant and therefore uh, uh, they've, they've, they've strung power up the mountain. Okay. It was such a long distance and it's so desolate. I was assuming that wasn't the case, but so, so it is. One great advantage of the weather there is that basically nothing happens. So once you lay down <laughs> the wires, you know, there's, there are no snowstorms to blow them down and they, they'll, they'll stay there for decades. Thank you. Um, it, you mentioned that, um, the, dark, the frame, the bias frames and the flat frames are done during the late afternoon, during the daylight, not at night. Yeah. Why, why is that not during the nighttime, during the, before oh, the observing? Oh, it's simply done to, to maximize efficiency. So they can, they can get the, the dome quite dark and then they have lamps to illuminate the, the, what's called the great white spot, that big white sheet that they use for flat fields. And after sunset, there's this huge bustle of activity to get ready for the observing. And they just don't oh. want to take the time. The, oh. the sequence of biases and flats takes roughly 45 minutes at the, at the moment. Uh, oh, okay. uh, they're, they're almost all biases and flats. I, they, the one advantage of liquid nitrogen cooling these detectors is that the dark current, taking a dark exposure is basically taking a bias with cosmic rays. Uh, and so you actually don't want the darks because they're full of like, cosmic rays if you take long exposures. Um, so it's 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 just biases and flats. Okay. There's been some progress in figuring out what it's not. So there are a couple things that have been ruled out. Among the people working on detecting dark matter on Earth, a lot more emphasis is now going into a different sort of model for dark matter. So the problem with dark matter is that that if you're a particle physicist, there's like a thousand different things it could be. It's not that it's not that there aren't any things that dark matter could be, it's that we have no idea how to distinguish them. And they're all really hard to detect. Um, from an observational point of view, there's been some work on uh, trying to, to pin down what predictions for alternate theories. So like if you modify gravity, what would happen? It turns out none of those have been particularly successful, uh, but they haven't really helped us determine what the, the dark matter is. Um, so this, this proposal is basically to try to provide one bit of evidence of what it might not be, because a lot of the models for particle physics suggest it shouldn't interact, and so you shouldn't see anything. And so if we see something, then that really does narrow down the models a lot. Okay, thank you. In that sense, dark matter is different from dark energy, right? Dark matter, it's, it's normal. I, I hate to say that because it is kind of weird, but it, in that sense, it, it behaves like other stuff. And so it's just stuff that we don't detect. It, you know, it could have been neutrinos. It turns out it's not neutrinos, but we know neutrinos exist. Neutrinos act like dark matter in, in some way. Dark energy is weird because nothing else acts like it. And that's, that's the thing that makes people more uncomfortable about it.
Uh, Jan, I'm working yeah. on the Galaxy Cluster uh, um, program with the Astronomy Astronomical League. Um, one, I'll have to try to get you interested in that. <laughs> and then I want to talk to you more about the Abel uh, Galaxy Clusters at some point. Sure, a absolutely. You know, there are some northern Abel Clusters that are particularly good. Uh, Coma, of course, is an Abel Cluster, so that, that's an obvious one. But there are, there are some other ones that are very, very nice. DCAM, because it's at minus 30, our survey tops out at plus 20 DEC. So right. we basically don't want to point the telescope that far over. And so the, the entire sky north of plus 20 isn't really being covered. I have a colleague in Japan who's slowly chipping away at it with the Subaru telescope, but he, he gets a night every year and you can't really finish a survey on one night a year. Well, I've been using I've been using the 17 inch down in Chile at the SLU. Uh, oh, observatory. so you're actually looking at the same clusters. Yeah, I can point you to some interesting ones. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, one of the, the neat things that comes about is these clusters are full of galaxies that are called jellyfish galaxies. I don't know if you've heard what a jellyfish is. So jellyfish galaxies are are spiral galaxies that are falling into the cluster for the first time. And so when they hit the gas, the hot gas of the cluster, that hot gas strips off all the cold gas that's in the galaxy, setting off a burst of star formation behind the galaxy in these tentacles that look like jellyfish. So you get this very blue burst of star formation. And then, you know, the last 100 million years after that, you've, you're left with an S0 or a dead galaxy. But in, in this first pass, the galaxies are spectacular. And we're detecting a couple for every galaxy cluster at this, this magnitude. Any other questions? Guess not. Well, this was have been really good. I really very much appreciate it. Back some memories of my trips to Chile. Yeah, and I have a question for you. Yeah, it's too late. <laughs> will, will any of your work be able to be done using the James Webb? So the field of view of the web is very small compared to, so DCAM has a field of view that's two degrees on a side, right? So that's why I want to use it. Uh, the web's field of view is, I think the widest camera is like six arc minutes on a side. So uh, yeah. the first answer is it's gonna be hard to look at these clusters. You can look at much higher redshift clusters where the field of view is much smaller. But the real answer is, you know, web is oversubscribed 17 to one in its first year. <laughs> there was no way that I would get telescope time for something that I could do from the ground for web. Yeah. Uh, so for the moment, I'm not using web. Um, the next big telescope for me is the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. That's the next space telescope to launch. That will have a half degree field of view, half degree on the side field of view, uh, and have the image quality of Hubble. So How about the like Rubin, will you be able to use the will you be able to use the Rubin? Oh yeah, yeah. No, the Rubin is is I, that's my other main research focus right now. Is is I, I'm actually going to be helping with the commissioning of that telescope starting in May. But again, not going down to Chile. So commissioning is is helping with the commissioning means looking at images and figuring out what's wrong with the images, not so much actually touching the hardware. <laughs> yeah, they may. After after Rubin commissions, that's where my research will be until till Roman launches. I should mention that in addition to all this fancy work that Jan's been doing, he started making a six inch mirror today. And may finish by the time the, the Rubin launches. We'll see. Or the Rubin, the Roman launches. Yeah, I guess we doesn't seem like we have other questions. Um, 